Our second method to pursue our adaptationist program is the experimental method. So to recall, we use the hypothetical deductive method and strong inference, right? We're doing deduction with multiple hypotheses. So we have a hypothesis, there are proposed adaptations that account for a trait or suite of traits we see. We make predictions. The predictions arise from our hypothesis and allow us to test it. And arguably, hypothesis testing is a definition of science. So some people, if you ask them what, what is science, science is hypothesis testing. We do experiments to test specific predictions for the truth, and the ability to separate factors is going to be a key advantage in our experimental method. And many correct predictions strengthen a theory. Any false prediction either weakens or eliminates it. And in practical matters, we don't immediately throw away a really well-supported hypothesis that's supported by other predictions. Um, if it just makes one bad one, we recognize that it is weakened, and then we seek to find out what's going on. So this guy here, you may recognize, this is Einstein. He's, he's one of the two most famous physicists of all time, right? You have Isaac Newton, who started physics, and then Einstein, who's famous, and everybody forgets about Maxwell Clerk, who's the best physicist between the two of them. But why is this guy famous? Well, he's famous for relativity, but it turns out he actually got his Nobel Prize for an explanation of black body radiation because what was going on in the very early part of the 20th century is that the physics that Newton had invented and all the other physicists had been working with ever since then made certain predictions about what would happen when certain materials got hot or exposed to radiation. And when the technology was invented to make those measurements, the predictions coming from early physics, from physics that had been around for a long time, were wrong. They were making bad predictions. But physics had been used for two or three hundred years and had made a whole bunch of really good predictions that we didn't totally scrap old-fashioned physics just because it made one bad prediction. We recognized it made a bad prediction and then we got lucky and this guy came up with a new modernized version of physics that included the old physics and had some new stuff like relativity that allowed us to basically preserve it. So when we had our old physics and it made a few false predictions, we didn't eliminate it, we recognized it was weakened and then we modified it. So we use this whole method when we're doing science and the most common thing that we do in science these days realistically is perform experiments. So let's look at an example. Coral snakes are colorful, right? So they have these red and yellow and black bands. And why, right? So why are these snakes so colorful? It's a kind of unusual trait. It's kind of interesting. They look almost like a flag. It's clearly something's going on, right? Because a lot of snakes are just brown or green. So if we're thinking about this, we want to come up with some hypotheses that would explain this color pattern. What we want to do is we want to go out in nature, look at these guys, we want to think about everything we know about snakes, and then try to come up with at least one hypothesis, but ideally several hypotheses in order to test them, right? We want to do strong inference. So here's three hypotheses. First, this color pattern could be something called aposematic coloration. So this is a bright color that warns away potential predators. So maybe this snake is poisonous, and the color pattern will act as a warning to predators that they are poisonous, so predators will stay away. Or maybe this is cryptic coloration, right? So maybe on natural background, this pattern is hard for predators to see, right? So for us, with our eyes, these guys stick out like sore thumbs. But maybe for the predators that attack snakes, this actually would cause them to camouflage and blend in, uh, right? Maybe predators use different cues than we do. And then we want a third hypothesis that maybe there's no selective reason. Maybe this color pattern has nothing to do with predation. Maybe it's sexual selection. Or maybe there's just something about the development of these snakes. Maybe there's selection for something else that has resulted in this color pattern. So aposematic coloration is fairly common in nature. So these are poison arrow frogs, right? So poisonous means if you eat it, it's going to kill you or cause damage, as opposed to venomous, which is if they were to bite something and had venom in their fangs. These guys don't have venom, they have poison, and they have a bright coloration that warns predators that they are poisonous. You may have heard of monarch butterflies and viceroy butterflies. So monarch butterflies, um, they eat milkweed when they're young, and when they're caterpillar, and they end up tasting really horrible. 
And then you may have heard of viceroy butterflies that look like monarch butterflies despite the fact that they don't taste horrible, right? So this is a really interesting example. Uh, these guys taste really bad, so they have a bright coloration to indicate that to predators. These guys don't taste really bad, but they have a color pattern that's kind of copying these guys so that predators will also not eat them. And so that's actually, this is an example that's used in a lot of high school classes, right? Monarchs and then viceroys are kind of copying them. It's also, I think, an intrabio even. Turns out that that story about monarchs and viceroys is inaccurate. It's been known to be inaccurate for a long time. This is a paper from 91. So this is a paper from Nature, and scientific papers have abstracts, which are a summary of the paper. And so what I've done is I've taken the abstract and I've highlighted a few things. So first of all, mimics models and predators in a Batesian mimicry system. So that's where one of them is unpalatable, and then the mimic is palatable. Batesian mimics, right, they're different. One is poisonous or unpalatable, the other is just copying it. And so there's this famous um, Viceroy Monarch story, which would be Batesian mimicry. So what these guys did in this paper from 91 is they went back and they tested it by getting viceroys and monarchs, and they fed them to birds in captivity, and they found that the viceroys were as unpalatable as the monarchs, and were actually more unpalatable than a different group. And so it turns out that the viceroys were not copying unpalatable monarchs, they were in fact just as unpalatable as monarchs, and had the same color pattern because they had the same features, right? It's selectively advantageous to look like another species that is also unpalatable, even if you yourself are unpalatable. So it turns out viceroys are what are called Mullerian co-mimics. So Mullerian is when both species are poisonous or unpalatable. This story of monarchs tasting bad and viceroys tasting fine but looking like monarchs to get the benefit is better understood as a case of Mullerian mimicry and has been for over 20 years. The second type of coloration that we mentioned for our coral snake example is cryptic coloration. So there are a number of organisms that have interesting color patterns or features that make them blend into the background. Right? This is a gecko, this is a lizard that looks a lot like the leaves that it's near. This is an insect, a katydid, looking a lot like the leaves it lives on. This is a spider on this tree. Right? Body's right there, the legs are there. This is a speckled sand dab, that's a fish, right? that blends in very well to its surroundings. This is a, a bird, right? it's not particularly camouflaged there, but from another angle, you can hardly tell it against the, the branches of the tree. And even domestic cats um, can sometimes blend into their surroundings quite well. How do we test this color pattern? Is it aposomatic, a warning about being poisonous or venomous? Or is it cryptic, they are actually blending into their background as well as that domestic cat did in the previous slide? Or is there no selective reason? So what sort of experiment can we do to test this? And ideally an experiment that will separate these two factors from each other. One of the useful aspects of your scientific education is hopefully you are learning how to think about what sorts of experiments to do when faced with certain questions. And in fact this is one of the goals if we think about the education that we try to give students at this university is to really try to help students become able to design experiments to test hypotheses. Now that's not easy, right? It's not a simple thing to do. It's an advanced scientific skill but you guys are going to get degrees and you'll be advanced scientists. So thinking about how to do experiments is something you really want to um, spend time on. So what sort of experiment could we do to test these things? So here's the experiment that was done in this paper here. What they did is they took and they made models out of modeling clay. They made some models that had the color pattern of the snakes. They made other models that were brown Otherwise, they're basically the same size and shape. They're the same material. And what they did is they put them on a white background, and they put them out in the environment where these snakes ordinarily live. And then they're able to observe predation, not with cameras, but because these things are made out of modeling clay, if a bird attacks it, okay, once the bird bites it, it's going to realize it's not an animal and it'll leave, but it'll leave a bite mark. So they can go back and they can like count the number of bite marks on their models to see how often they were attacked. And so now we want to think about, okay, so this is the experiment that was done. 
what are the predictions that would arise from each of our hypotheses. So if this is an aposomatic color pattern, birds will be afraid of the snakes, so you would expect them to attack the brown one more than the colored one. If it's cryptic coloration, by putting it against the white background, now these guys are exposed, but they're just as exposed as these guys, you would expect the number of attacks on brown to be the same as the number of attacks on the colored. And if there's no selective reason, again, if there's no nothing going on, you would expect the number of attacks to be equal. So now we have some predictions arising from our hypotheses. We have a way to measure them. So we can go out, do this experiment, like these guys did, and see which of these two patterns occurs. So this is the data they got, and they <laughs> color-coded it by the color pattern. So the number of attacks on average against the brown snake, or the brown fake snake, was much higher than the number of attacks against the fake snake that had the coral snake pattern. So this data here, that there's more attacks on the brown ones than on the colored ones, is consistent with aposomatic coloration, right? would support that hypothesis, but would not support the hypothesis of cryptic coloration and would not support a hypothesis that the color pattern doesn't matter. Now let's look at a second experiment. So this arises from um, physical characteristics of birds and thoughts about parasite resistance. So first off, birds are known to have lots of bright color patterns. Male birds are often brightly colored or have big ornaments like big tails, actually more than females. So it turns out when you look at a lot of bird species, the males are brightly colored, but the females are not. And when you actually look at the sorts of behaviors of birds, females prefer to mate with the most extreme featured males. So it turns out that when you look at birds that have long tails, females prefer the males with the longest tails. So let's have a hypothesis. A hypothesis is that this color pattern or these extreme traits represent a good genes principle that maybe is related to parasite resistance, which is the specific example we'll look at. These good genes lead to kind of better immune systems or resistant to parasite. Because males who better resist parasites when they're young, they're, the, they're not as sick, right? So they're then the ones who can build the long tails, the big ornaments, and they would be more brightly colored because they have more energy for the production of these um, colors. And so females choose the features, the bright color or the long tails, as a proxy for parasite resistance, right? They can't look at the male and know which male has a better immune system or which one's more resistant to parasites, but if they look to see the males that have grown the longest tails or are the brightest colors, those males probably have the better immune system. So here's a hypothesis. Here's some suggestive data. When we look at a bunch of different types of birds, we measure the male brightness on a scale here and measure the amount of parasites that they're exposed to on a scale here. The more parasites there are, the brighter the males are, right? And when there's no parasites, the males aren't particularly bright. And that is consistent with our hypothesis, right? Because if parasites aren't a problem, then females choosing brightly colored males, that would not be an advantage because parasites aren't a problem. But where parasites are a real problem, those males having more brightly colored feathers indicate being able to deal with a common problem. On the other hand, this is just a pattern, right? This is just a correlation. And correlation doesn't automatically imply causation because if you think about this another way, where there are more parasites, the males are more brightly colored, so females choosing more brightly colored males would maybe be females choosing males that have more exposure to parasites, which is something that doesn't really make any sense. So although this data, data like this, can be interpreted to support our model, correlation is not automatically causation. We want something better than just this. So we should do an experiment. So here's an experiment that was done not looking at brightly colored feathers, but looking at the length of a tail. So does an extreme trait represent a genetic resistance, some sort of good genes? So what this individual did in his study is he went to a bunch of nests where there were parasites present, and this is um, a number of mites. So you can actually go, you can grab a baby bird and look at its nest, and you can count the number of parasites. So the y-axis in these three figures is the number of parasites on offspring in those nests. So when you go to nests and you look at the male that's at that nest and you look at the number of mites on its offspring, the longer the tail of the male, the fewer parasites on his offspring, right? The shorter the tail of the male, the more parasites on his offspring. So this data is really showing that 
when the genetic father has a longer tail, the offspring have fewer mites. So females, if they chose longer males, they would be getting offspring that have fewer mites. But this isn't the whole answer, right? Because maybe it's just something like males with longer tails do a better job of like picking mites off their offspring or something, right? So maybe it's not a genetic trait that's connecting long tails to mite resistance. Maybe it's some sort of behavior. So, and we can't separate those two things, right? So females choosing long tailed males, are they getting better genes for their offspring? Or are they getting better behavior in those males with long tails? We can't separate those two factors just from this observation. So we need to do an experiment. So the experiment was to take eggs from some nests and transplant them into different nests. So now you can create cases where you can look at an offspring, you can count the number of mites on that offspring, and then you can compare that to the length of the male who's running that nest, and you can compare it to the length of the male that was the genetic father that is not actually helping that offspring by removing any mites. This is when you take an offspring and put it in another nest that has a different male, compare the number of parasites it has to the tail of the genetic father, you see this same decrease. But when you compare the number of mites to the tail of the male that is living in that nest, you see like no relationship. So this relationship here between the num number of mites and the length of the tail of the male who is also the father of the nest, it's a genetic relationship, right? Because when you separate the factors of genetic parentage from behavioral parentage, it's the genetic parentage that shows the relationship between mites and tail length, not the behavioral parentage. So doing a study like this shows that there's a genetic link between the length of the tail of those males and the ability to resist mites by the offspring of those males. That's exactly the sort of data you would expect to see if you have a hypothesis that females are choosing longer tailed males because those males have good genes that the females will then be able to get in their offspring. And again, we were only able to separate these two factors of the genes versus the behavior of the males by doing an experiment. If we only had the optimality observation method, we'd have this data and we wouldn't be able to fully answer our question. So the experimental method does have some weaknesses of its own. So we can't always perform experiments. So for moral reasons, right, there are all sorts of experiments we could do, but we don't want to hurt or damage nature, right? So say we wanted to do an experiment to alter giraffe necks, like maybe we could put metal rings on giraffes to make them grow longer necks, or we could like stunt the growth of giraffes by doing operations on them with their juveniles. We could alter giraffe necks and do an experiment, but that doesn't really seem like the sort of thing we should be doing, right? That's there are moral reasons not to do some sorts of experiments. One of my favorite experiments in ecology consisted of taking and putting tents over little mangrove trees off the coast of Florida and gassing them and killing all the insects with pesticide and then going and seeing how the insects recolonize those little islands. Well, in the process, they dumped a whole bunch of really poisonous pesticide into this mangrove swamp area. They killed actually some of the trees in more enlightened days, we wouldn't really want to do an experiment that ended up killing all sorts of stuff, even if it does give us good scientific data. Um, secondly, again practically, right? we may not be able to make all the observations we would like to make. We were able to do an experiment with these coral snakes because we have um, modeling clay. If modeling clay didn't exist, that experiment would not have as easy to do. So there are practical concerns. And then finally, there's a temporal factor, right? Experiments are done in the present, and almost all experiments have to, by necessity, be short-term, right? Like, what student would you ever be able to get in your lab to do a 10-year-long experiment? Nobody's be willing to do that. And what experiment could we do with dinosaurs, right? If we're trying to figure out stuff from the past, what experiment could we do with organisms that are no longer alive? So when we're doing experiments, we have this weakness that most experiments are short-term, and they're all in the present, that limits the sorts of things we can do. So we have this second method, this experimental method, that's really good about separating factors, which the optimality observation method couldn't do, but it does have its own weaknesses, so all by itself, 
we're not able to use experiments to answer all of our questions, we want to complement that with observations and optimality, and also with our next technique, which is the comparative method.